Today is November the 18th. Today, we see early church problems. Today, I'd like you to read 1 Corinthians, the first four chapters. The Corinthian book, um, the epistle to the Corinthians, was uh, probably written as Paul began his third uh, missionary journey. Um, he addresses it to the Corinthians. There are five issues, five problems that he wants to address. Some of those problems Paul identifies. Some of those problems the Corinthian church wrote him about. The first four chapters, our section for today, deals with the problem of divisions. But it's not divisions between Jew and Gentile. It's divisions according to personalities in the first church, whether Paul himself or Apollos or, or Peter or Jesus himself. Paul addresses that in the first four chapters. Chapters 5 through 7, he deals with sex. Uh, Roman society and Greek society was very sexually oriented. Jewish society was not. Paul expresses teaching about an appropriate approach to sex in 5 through 7. 8 through 10, he deals with food that's been sacrificed to idols. 11 to 14, he deals with the worship gatherings and how to organize them. Chapter 15, he answers questions about the resurrection. Then in chapter 16, he gives a personal greeting to the church. Today, we'll just read the first four chapters. Enjoy that as we read together. 1 Corinthians 1-4, through 4, New Living Translation. 1 Corinthians 1. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, and from our brother Sosthenes. I am writing to God's church in Corinth, to you who have been called by God to be his own holy people. He made you holy by means of Jesus Christ, just as he did for all people everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. I always thank my God for you and for the gracious gifts he has given you. Now that you belong to Christ Jesus, through him God has enriched your church in every way, with all of your eloquent words and all of your knowledge. This confirms that what I told you about Christ is true. Now you have every spiritual gift you need as you eagerly wait for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will keep you strong to the end, so that you will be free from all blame on the day our Lord Jesus Christ returns. God will do this, for He is faithful to do what He says, and He has invited you into partnership with His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church, rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. For some members of Chloe's household have told me about your quarrels, dear brothers and sisters. Some of you are saying, I am a follower of Paul. Others are saying, I follow Apollos, or I follow Peter, or I follow only Christ. Has Christ been divided into fractions? Was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were any of you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not. I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, for now no one can say that they were baptized in my name. Oh yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus, but I don't remember baptizing anyone else, for Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news and not with clever speech, for fear that the cross of Christ would lose its power. The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction, but we who are being saved know it as the very power of God. 
as the scriptures say, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. So where does this leave the philosophers and scholars and the world's brilliant debaters? God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish, since God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom. He has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. It is foolish to the Jews, who ask for signs from heaven, and it is foolish to the Greeks, who seek human wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. But to those called by God's salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. This foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest human plans, and God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in this world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise, and he chooses things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chooses things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and use them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can even boast in the presence of God. God has untied you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy, and he freed us from sin. Therefore, as the scriptures say, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. 1 Corinthians 2 When I first came to you, dear brothers and sisters, I didn't use lofty words and impressive wisdom to tell you God's secret plan, for I had decided that while I was with you, I would forget everything except Jesus, the one who was crucified. I came to you in weakness, timid and trembling, and my message and my preaching were very plain. Rather than using clever and persuasive speeches, I relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit. I did this so you would trust not in human wisdom, but in the power of God. Yet when I am among mature believers, I do speak with words of wisdom, but not the kind of wisdom that belongs to this world or to the rulers of this world, who are soon forgotten. No, this wisdom we speak of is the mystery of God, his plan that was previously hidden, even though he made it for our ultimate glory before the world began. But the rulers of this world have not understood it. If they had, they would not have crucified our glorious Lord. That is what the scriptures mean when it says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. But it was to us that God revealed these things by his Spirit, for his Spirit searches out everything and shows God's deep secrets. No one can know a person's thought except the person's own spirit, and no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. And we received God's Spirit, not the world's Spirit. So we can know these wonderful things God has freely given us. When we tell you these things, we do not use words that come from human wisdom. Instead, we speak words given to us by the Spirit, using the Spirit's words to explain spiritual truths. But people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's Spirit. It all sounds foolish to them, and they can't understand it. For only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit means— those who are spiritual can evaluate all things, but they themselves cannot be evaluated by others. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to teach him? But we understand these things, for we have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 3 Dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. I had to talk as though you belonged to this world, or as though you were infants in Christ. I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger, and you still aren't ready, for you are still controlled by your sinful nature. You are jealous of one another and quarrel with each other. Doesn't that prove you are controlled by your sinful nature? Aren't you living like people of the world? When one of you says, I am a follower of Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, aren't you acting just like the people of the world? 
After all, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? We are only God's servants, through whom you believe the good news. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. I planted the seed in your hearts, and Apollos watered it, and it was God who made it grow. It isn't important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. The one who plants and the one who waters work together with the same purpose, and both will be rewarded for their own hard work. For we are both God's workers, and you are God's field. You are God's building. Because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it. But whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw, but on Judgment Day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if the person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through the wall of flames. Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God lives in you? God will destroy anyone who destroys his temple. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Stop deceiving yourselves. If you think you are wise by this world's standards, you need to become a fool to be truly wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. As the scriptures say, he traps the wise in the snares of their own cleverness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise. He knows they are worthless. So don't boast about following a particular human leader, for everything belongs to you, whether Paul or Apollos or Peter or the world or life and death or the present and the future. Everything belongs to you, and you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. 1 Corinthians 4 So look at Apollos and me as mere servants of Christ who have been put in charge of explaining God's mysteries. Now a person who is put in charge as a manager must be faithful. As for me, it matters very little how I might be evaluated by you or by any human authority. I don't even trust my own judgment on this point. My conscience is clear, but that doesn't prove I'm right. It is the Lord himself who will examine me and decide. So don't make judgments about anyone ahead of time before the Lord returns, for he will bring our darkest secrets to light and reveal our private motives. Then God will give each one whatever praise is due. Dear brothers and sisters, I have used Apollos and myself to illustrate what I have been saying. If you pay attention to what I have quoted from the scriptures, you won't be proud of your leaders at the expense of another. For what gives you the right to make such a judgment? What do you have that God hasn't given you? And if everything you have is from God, why boast as though it were not a gift? You think you already have everything you need. You think you are already rich. You have begun to reign in God's kingdom without us. I wish you really were reigning already, for then we would be reigning with you. Instead, I sometimes think God has put us apostles on display like prisoners of war at the end of the victor's parade, commanded to die. We have become a spectacle to the entire world, to people and angels alike. Our dedication to Christ makes us look like fools, but you claim to be so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are so powerful. You are honored, but we are ridiculed. Even now we go hungry and thirsty, and we don't have enough clothes to keep warm. We are often beaten and have no home. We work wearily with our own hands to earn our living. We bless those who curse us. We are patient with those who abuse us. We appeal gently when evil things are said about us. And we are treated like the world's garbage, like everybody's trash, right up to the present moment. I am not writing these things to shame you, but to warn you as my beloved children, even if you had 10,000 others to teach you about Christ, you only have one spiritual father. For I became your father in Christ Jesus, 
when I preach the good news to you, so I urge you to imitate me. That's why I have sent Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. He will remind you of how I follow Christ Jesus, just as I teach in all the churches wherever I go. Some of you have become arrogant, thinking I will not visit you again, but I will come, and soon, if the Lord lets me. And then I will find out whether these arrogant people just give pretentious speeches or whether they really have God's power. For the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk. It is living by God's power. Which do you choose? Should I come with a rod to punish you? Or should I come with love and a gentle spirit? Scripture reading by Emily Herrera. Like, follow, and subscribe to this devotional on whatever platform you use to listen to it. Email your questions to us at questions at becomehope.com. Tomorrow, we'll turn to the book of Psalms and hear David say, Oh God, save me from myself. If you live in the Greenwood, Indiana area and you're looking for a church, come check out New Hope Church. We're at 5307 West Fairview Road. I'd love to see you tomorrow morning at 10 a.m.